my name is Nancy, and I am currently working at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I've been there a little bit over 20 years, so I worked on the floor for about seven and a half years, and um, I uh, do some research. I also now work in clinic, and I work with survivors. So I work with all the different populations, and in addition to that, I'm a research coordinator, so I also work on some of the trials, so I get a little better understanding of what's going on. So I know there's a number of different people today, and I wanted to cover three main areas. Kids in therapy, um, complementary and alternative medicine, a little bit about that, and then about survivorship. So you have an outline that really has everything, so you're not going to need to write things down. So um, first, of course, why is nutrition important? People don't know who's involved with their... Can I just ask for hands how many people in here have kids in treatment right now? No? Okay. Um, kids done with treatment? You do? Okay. All right. So we have a little bit of a mix. All right. So um, this, you know, the outline really applies to everybody. The importance of nutrition, who's involved with, with your child's care, how is cancer treated, and what are some of the side effects. And just because a child is done with treatment doesn't mean they're done with the side effects. And um, what are some nutrition plans? Where do we begin? How, um, how do we decide what to do with nutrition? And then the methods that are used to provide nutrition. Parents often want to know what should I feed my child at different stages of therapy, even when they're done. And then a little bit about um, CAM, or complementary and alternative medicine, when therapy is done. And then we'll summarize. And we will have a quiz at the end of this. But you get gift cards if you get them all right. So, all right, so we all know nutrition is important for growth and development. Um, decreasing complications and improving quality of life and again this is through therapy and when kids get done so who may be involved in your child's care and this I think people find out about them when there's a problem so uh, definitely a doctor a nurse a dietitian often comes in when there's problems it's very rare that they come in just to say hello and then um, diet technicians may help with education we have social workers, pharmacists, all of the therapists, and I think that probably people in here have experienced may, perhaps having therapists involved because of one need or another, whether it's physical, occupational, or speech. And when I talk about speech, I'm not just talking about language, but eating as well. And then child life specialists, and I have to put a plug in for them because I think they're really wonderful with helping children when they're going through therapy and procedures, and I think they're underutilized. So. Everybody knows about the different ways cancer is treated, and I always bring this up because each of these methods has their own side effects. They can be acute or they can be um, late, late effects. So some of the problems with treatment, kids can become undernourished, and this can carry on even when kids are done with treatment. They can have all the problems, not wanting to eat, infections um, from the therapy, the mucositis, difficulty swallowing, their organs can be affected, and moving into survivorship, it's all about monitoring for anything that might have happened during therapy that um, could present with late effects. So when I talk about these things, they may not be acute, they may be late effects. Uh, someone may have difficulty swallowing, may, they may continue to have problems with their, their gut. And we also have people that still have altered energy needs way after therapy. Um, I notice one of the things that's interesting to me is the taste changes that carries on even after kids are well, well done with therapy. And then there may be metabolic changes. So some of the things that happen with kids, and this is important, they're not going to school. It's stressful, whether you're in the hospital or in clinic. It's a disruption, right, in life. And kids aren't with who they usually are with, their friends, their family. They can, to me, they become depressed. They can be sad. They can also be very angry or fearful of what's going on, not understanding things. With food, they can have aversions. There are kids who remember a smell and associate that with food, and they will not eat that food again. And I think for parents and kids, it can be very frustrating. So a long list, I'm not sure where your children are at in this list, but this is a list of kids that we know have trouble with nutrition. And what I, what I mean by that is they will often have a difficult time meeting their needs during therapy and perhaps after therapy. It's a long list. The list for low risk for nutritional problems is much shorter. And um, it doesn't mean that kids on this list won't have problems. It means they're less likely to have problems. 
So, and this is to me, when I see, and, and it's not just kids in therapy. When they're undernourished, and even undernourished when they finish therapy, they're often lethargic, they're often irritable. If they're younger, they're not interested in playing. So very important to realize that it may not be that they are depressed, but they may not be well nourished, and that can affect them. So some of the things that, and I, and I want to touch on this because people may still, some kids may still be having problems. If someone is not hungry, they have anorexia. And what we suggest is small meals. Never overwhelm anybody. Small meals, small plates, small glasses. Um, minimize odors. Even after therapy is done, smelling of food cooking, I suggest opening the window, putting an exhaust fan on, um, especially when you're cooking something like um, onions and spaghetti sauce, very strong flavors. And make sure it's relaxed. Food can become very stressful with eating. And another thing parents ask about are appetite stimulants. And we've gotten more savvy with these over the last couple of years. There are a couple of different ones that we use quite often. One is megase or megastrol acetate. And this is a progesterone. So certain cancers we would not want to use this with because they may have a sensitivity to the hormone. But it does work well with increasing appetite on short term you know, use short term. There are some consequences and complications with it. We don't like to use it long term. The next one is periactin, which is actually something that's used in asthma, and it helps to stimulate appetite when it's used frequently right before meals. The last one, which I tend to like the most, is Marinol. This is the active ingredient in marijuana that they make in a lab. It has the same properties, meaning it's an appetite stimulant, and it also helps with nausea and vomiting. It's a wonderful medication during therapy and even after because it helps to take that queasiness away. And it has two roles, so that's one of the reasons I like it. Um, some kids have trouble with taste. Things don't taste right. They don't, you know, if that's the case, take away offensive foods. Experiment with seasoning. Almost always they go for salty, spicy, flavorful pickles, olives, and that's because they can taste it. And that seems to go on after therapy is done. If um, things don't taste good to them, food, uh, food served at room temperature or cold are often better tolerated. And again, salty, spicy, flavorful. So this is one that I think with mouth dryness that goes on if somebody has radiation um, to the mouth because they're not making the saliva. So sometimes modifying foods, making sure they have liquid like meats, having gravy on them. Um, artificial saliva, which I can tell you that most kids don't like the taste of it, the feel of it, um, but it's worth trying. Sauces, gravies, always serve liquids with meals. And what I find is that in survivorship is that they've learned to chase food with liquid. A bite of food, liquid. And they've learned to do this just because it works. So if there's difficulty with swallowing, which is dysphagia, things like modifying the food, soft consistency, Sometimes not having spicy foods or acidic foods because they can come back up. And then, again, drinking after small bites. And some of the worst things to eat would be like crackers because they get stuck. They're very, very dry. So um, early satiety means they're, means they're getting filled rather quickly. So when um, kids are getting full rather quickly, what we want to do, very, very small meals. If Think about it when you've had the flu and somebody gives you a plate full of food and they say, just eat what you want, but you're looking at this plate and it's too much, it can be overwhelming. So small amounts, minimize low calorie foods like salads. And then um, with nausea and vomiting, this can also um, go on after therapy is done, particularly in children who have had brain tumors and they've had surgery and they've had radiation. So what we say is sometimes bland, dry foods, smells can trigger nausea. Not just foods, cleaning solutions, alcohol, all of these things kids remember, and, they, and that can be a trigger, brushing the teeth. So often I'll tell people if they're nauseated, don't bend over. That's going to make it easier to gag and throw up. Stand up brushing your teeth. I know it sounds odd, but these things, every, every child is different. So again, avoid things that are offensive, eat, drink slowly, adjust the food temperature. Um, should always be very comfortable in clothes. I tell people, keep the fans going. You know, especially in this weather, it's so hot. And then also, we forget that there are medications that, that kids might still need, antiemetics. For nausea, we, they may need medication to help the food move out of their stomach. So um, if someone has mucositis, 
This is where we often say avoid foods that are going to be that are going to hurt. And what do kids want? They want the things that are spicy that they can taste. And usually, if they can tolerate them, then it's what they'll eat. But if they can't, if it hurts, then you need to stay away from it. Um, cold foods are often very soothing. If you are in the hospital, always order a hot meal and a cold meal. So if your child does not want something hot, you have something cold to offer them. All right, and if, as far as the hot meal, never take the lid off in the room. It's very nauseating for them. It's like opening a dishwasher in mid-cycle. So, um, all right, so we talked about mucositis. And remember that mucositis can go from mouth to bottom, so it can really affect the whole system. If your child is constipated, I think I hear this one probably more than anything, because kids eat like kids, and teenagers eat like teenagers, which means usually no fr fruits and vegetables. Some of the things that help are fiber and fluid and juice. Dried fruit is one of the best things. You know fruit leathers that they sell? One of the best things that you can do is to try it. Do you know what I'm talking about, fruit leathers? Fruit Not, kind of well, the more right, exactly. Fruit roll-up is on the same level, but it's got more sugar and stuff. So try to kind of steer you more towards the ones that are just fruit and juice. And um, they're wonderful for a daily help out with this. If you have you know, a child who likes to eat, then take raisins, cook them down in apple juice, puree them, and add them to whatever you're making. It's a wonderful way to get dried, you know, dried fruit in, and they will know. It'll just make it more moist. Um, water is probably one of the most important things because kids sometimes don't feel like drinking, forget to drink. So then the next thing is diarrhea. And this one, again, fluid is very important to make sure you get enough in. Often with younger kids, we forget, we forget that lactose is the milk sugar in formula and breast milk. When you have mucositis or you have damage to your intestine, the enzyme that you make, the lactase, goes down because there's damage. It will come back up again. But if you're not making the enzyme, you are what we would call lactose intolerant. So we often forget that this happens to kids and they haven't been eating and then they decide to eat and what they choose is ice cream or milk and then they get diarrhea. So I always suggest use the lactate milk. It's the same thing except they've added the enzyme. All right. So then another thing is you can use tablets. We often, and this is something that I recommend, is that we, we suggest increasing soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is pectin. You know, it's what jam has in it that gels it, and it's what's found in oats. And it often, and you can buy liquid pectin. So it's more of a dietary type of um, uh, technique or strategy just to help to gel and pull the water in so that diarrhea is not as bad. Some kids, if they have had radiation, have problems with this ongoing. So um, avoid high fat foods and make sure that things are cooked. So first thing, you know, if any of you have been in the hospital or in clinic, you probably have met with a dietitian. And what we look at, there's four things, and it's important, and we look at this forever. It's going to be anthropometric, which is weight and height, and then little ones, it's going to be how is their, their head growing, biochemical data, which are labs, clinical observations, you know, how are they doing? Where are they at in their, their therapy, and what is their, um, how are they eating? So when I think about anthropometrics, first thing is weight and height. And I have to put my plug in about weight here because very often I'll hear somebody say, oh, their weight's fine, it's stable for the last six months. So in a child that should be growing, stable is not appropriate. So I always ask that you request to see the growth chart. No matter where you are, they have either a paper growth chart or they have the growth chart on the computer. So um, always ask to see how your child is growing. And you want to see appropriate growth. Now, we often look at the body mass index. This is the relationship of the weight to the height for the age and sex of the child. So this is something that is a screening technique. It looks at the very far ends of over and underweight. That's in kids over two. And if all of you, if you have kids in school, you probably get something sent home from the nurse, a screening once a year about how they're doing. This is the same thing we're looking at. Now, the other thing we look at for those under two is weight to length. It's a different growth chart, so it's different parameters. We also look at what we call percent ideal body weight. What this is looking at is just the relationship of weight to height. It doesn't take into account age. So as kids, those of you that have teenagers, you know they sprout up, 
And then when kids are really young, they're a little bit um, chunkier looking until they start moving more. So that these are different things, but always you should ask to see the growth chart and how is your child not how is your child doing? Not just you know what is their weight, but how are they doing compared to themselves, their growth, and how are they compared on the growth chart? So um, and lastly, we look at the head. We also and this is something that I can look at rather easily on kids when I see them. I look at skin fold, which means I'm looking at their arms when they come in. If they have diapers on, I'm looking in their legs. I can see, do they have um, skin here? Do they, are they filled out? So some of the things that I'm looking at is, are they, have they lost weight? Do they have, you know, are their eyes sunken, temple wasting? Um, and for me, I can look at it and I can see a child especially someone who's newly diagnosed and goes through therapy. And then the last thing is we might use what's called arm muscle area, which is simply a measurement of looking at, at muscle mass. It's easier for me, most kids don't even want these things done to them, but understand that there's different ways that kids are assessed. So when we look at biochemical data, we're often looking at, not as a, as a physician, they're looking at counts, um, always counts, but we're looking at things like electrolytes, so sodium, potassium, we're looking, we're screening, how are the organs doing, the kidney, the liver, the pancreas. And then we're also interested in other things like calcium, phos, mag, and glucose. Some of these have to do with the fact that the chemotherapy causes wasting. So if you have wasting, then the child needs to take in more. So this can become problematic when a child can't take in enough and they're wasting things because their kidneys are a little bit leaky. Okay, so I also want to know, I'll always ask the, the families, how is your child doing? Are they interacting? I look at how they are with me. Um, what's their mood? Are they happy? Are they, um, are they depressed? Are they sad? Are they angry? Um, what's their activity level like? Are they sleeping all the time? You know, these are questions that we take for granted, you know, because kids that aren't going through therapy or don't have the past of therapy wouldn't have this layer of all of these things that have happened. And then also medical and emotional problems. How are they eating? So I want to know um, when somebody comes in and, and I hear they're eating, well, is it bites? Is it, um, are they just drinking? Are they just eating one food? So um, any changes, like do they not like certain textures anymore? Some kids become, they get down to like five foods. The younger they are, the more likely they are to refuse foods. And that's what we call food aversions. When they remember they have a food, they get sick, they don't want it anymore. So, or are they intolerant of anything? This is a long slide, but this pretty much, if you look at the, the things that are in red, weight loss, these are the things that stick out in my mind. Did your child lose 5% of their weight? It can be from diagnosis, it can be from a month ago. Um, but this is an absolute number. Always ask to look at the growth chart, because remember that looks at things over time. Ask how are they doing with their weight for height. This is the one that I was talking about, weight for life, when um, the younger kids. Ask to look at their BMI. All of these things are things that they should be showing you. These are the cutoffs that we're using. So someone may come in, and just to give you an idea, if we say your child should weigh 10 kilos, and they weigh nine to 11 kilos. That's normal range. Some kids are leaner, some kids are heavier. So we have these cutoffs, and as a dietitian, when we're assessing, we would look at how a child presents. An acute indicator is weight loss. That's what happens when your child doesn't get enough to eat, or they're burning too much. Then what is preserved is their growth, their linear growth. So first weight is affected, then linear growth, and the thing that is supported the most at any cost is the brain because the brain needs to grow. So that's the order of how our body preserves things. So what we recommend, dietary reference intake. And I will always say, families will say, what do I do with vitamins and minerals? You make sure that you're not giving anything more than what the RDA is. That is what is recommended for a certain age and a certain sex because we know that there's something called tolerable upper intake level for many nutrients that you can run into problems if you go above this. So more is not necessarily better. And then we look at something called the World Health Organization to determine calories and protein needs for kids.
So some kids may, may eat orally. That's the most important. And we have guidelines. They're in your, your handouts. These are some of the websites, the Cure Search, the um, NCI. There are oral supplements. How many have had experience with PD Sure and Ensure? And did they go well? Did they drink them? Mm, yeah. I, I think the best thing that we ever did at the hospital is nutrition came in with a tray full of like ten different mm -hmm. um, nutrients, and she tested try them. them out. These are so expensive. And yeah. For you to get a whole case of it. Well, just to know, so you know, um, there are some programs where we can get like six of them sent to you, so you don't have to get a whole case. And it is very hard to get insurance to pay for them if they're drinking them. So, um, but we have, we, there are some ways to get around that. Some of the companies will provide you with like a trial of six. So, you know, just know that that's available. Or if you have something in the hospital, you can take it home with you. Some insurance companies, what we're finding is that if a child is drinking 100% of their needs from formula or supplement, they'll prove it. If it's by tube, they'll prove it. If we're just using it as like 50% of their needs, they often will deny it. But that doesn't mean it's the end of it. That means that you have to appeal the denial. And if you don't appeal the denial, then it ends there. What I suggest parents do is if they get a letter of denial, that they immediately call either social worker or the doctor, and then if they give permission to CHOP, we can appeal it on their behalf. And then what I do is I will write the letter of medical necessity. And, it, and realize, though, that, as you're saying, it does not end if you're denied. So we talked about oral supplements. There's also some things that come out, and even after therapy, called modulars. It could be fat, protein, carbohydrate. One of my favorites is Benicalory. It's made by... Um, uh, same people who make Benefiber, and of course it's an online product that you, can, you can't you can buy in the stores, but it's a liquid, tasteless, one and a half ounces, has 330 calories, that's pretty good. It's not a pediasure, it's strictly a calorie supplement. And then recipes, one of the things I always go through with families that I work with, things that their kids are eating, so I, I go through ways to increase the calories in the foods that they're eating. If they could eat more, they'd eat more, but for instance, you know, adding oil to, um, adding more things to pancake mix, like oil, using complete mix, using um, a little bit of heavy cream. So there's all these different things that you can do with recipes and to modify it for each child. Um, everything's better with butter. Everything's better with butter. <laughs> and fat is your friend. So for children, it is the best source of energy. And again, we talked about appetite stimulants, and um, by mouth is best. If they can't eat enough to gain weight, you know, supplements or just eating. Um, as we said, supplements are great if your child will take them. But uh, I, I always say never threaten a child. If you don't eat, you're going to get this. And that, that is sad to me because I know sometimes it's the last-ditch effort. But kids eat for hunger, and there's so much going on that keeps them from eating during therapy. If a child can't eat enough, then often two feedings are recommended. GI problems need to be manageable, meaning mucositis needs to be um, not that severe <coughs> and adequate platelet count. Short-term kids get what we call a nasoenteric tube. That means we don't predict that they're going to be on feedings for a long period of time. The tube can go into the stomach or the intestine. And some kids long-term are those with facial uh, radiation might get what we call an enterostomy tube, which is placed directly into the stomach or the intestine. So we often try as, you know, um, uh, you know, parents often get worried that their child's not going to go back to eating. They will go back to eating. It just takes time. They may not eat for months and months and months. And then um, we, if we're feeding by tube feeding, we often like to feed at night and during the day to give them an opportunity to work on the calories during the day, their intake, and not have to work as hard. Um, if you have any kids who are on magnesium, potassium, Nutrifos, divide it during the day. It is very nauseating to get that all mixed up together at once. And then um, remember, antiemetics and motility agents. Motility agents help things to move through the stomach. If a child has a full stomach, then they're more likely to feel nauseated. If they're on two feeding, they're more likely to throw it up. And the two feeding early before they wake up. So these are all just strategies. And then we always say if the gut works, use it. 
tube feeding is much less expensive than parenteral nutrition or IV nutrition. And there can be irritation with G-tubes around the site, have to be careful with that. And there can be, just because you can put it in a tube doesn't mean they're going to tolerate it. So there does, there needs to be some different ways of managing um, feeds. But it does keep your gut healthy, and that's what we want to do. So just like your muscles, you don't use them, they don't stay as healthy and they atrophy. We have less infection with tube feeding than parenteral nutrition. And with the younger kids, it's really good because you can put meds down and it is a safe, effective way to provide nutrition. The last way is by IV or what we call parenteral. And this is when you can't meet the needs orally, often used after surgery or with GI problems. It is 10 times the cost of tube feeding, but it is easier to manage electrolytes. Remember I said if they're on a lot of oral supplements, very nauseating. This way it goes right into the line. But with everything, there are, there are benefits and risks. There's an increased risk for infection. And um, it does not, because you're not feeding into the gut, the gut, what we call will atrophy, will not stay as healthy. So parents often ask, what do I feed? It is no different than any other child. You know, if you have a child that is lactose intolerant, then certainly you'd want to watch that. If you have a child with allergies, then certainly you have that as another layer on top. But the goal is always for healthy foods, um, what you would be doing if your child was not going through therapy. So this is the first part now. To summarize, yes, kids are at risk for malnutrition. We have different ways that we can keep them nourished, and we can prevent and reverse malnutrition. Most important thing is be proactive at whatever stage your child is at and continue to monitor the child. I get a lot of questions on um, complementary and alternative medicine, so I was asked to, to uh, give you some information on this. So um, in kids with cancer, what we know is that parents are interested because they want to know if there are some complementary and alternative um, therapies that may help their child. And the idea is to minimize side effects. The, the um, difficult thing is that much of CAM has not undergone rigorous scientific testing. I put some information in your folder so that you can see an example of um, reliable information for CAM. And the other thing is that it depends on where you're treated, but often physicians and clinicians don't have much training in CAM. And um, so the way, this is the uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. This is the most reliable source for information. And the definition of CAM, a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, and products that are not generally considered part of conventional medicine. So that is their definition. The different types, and this is where I think people get confused. Conventional medicine is what we're usually used to, which is an MD or a DO, or all the therapists, the allied health professionals. When you have complementary medicine, it means along with conventional, so the two together. When we talk about alternative, it means instead of. And now we're moving into another more or less um, description of integrative medicine. And that's where they have more information about the safety and effectiveness. So the, um, the idea for myself with someone who is interested in um, any type of CAM therapy is to maintain or restore optimal uh, nutritional status. It can be challenging, and we know that some forms of CAM can help. But this means that the dietitian or whoever is working with your child needs to be educated. If I'm asked about a, about a specific um, product, I will research that product and I will provide the information to the family and the physician who has that, that child. Because that's a way of educating everybody involved and making sure that the family knows that what they're looking at is um, reliable information. So talk about some of the different, CAM has five domains. You probably pr all practice some of these in your life. The first is mind-body. This is when we look at how the, the interactions of the brain and the mind and the body and how they affect our physical functioning. All right, so the next one, um, and I like the mind-body. Sure. These are things like yoga, meditation, deep breathing. I mean, how often have we been told, take a deep breath? You know, especially when you're going to react and say something you might be sorry for later on. Um, manipulative body base. This would be things like focusing on the structure, the body structures, the bones, the joints, spinal manipulation. How good does it feel to get a massage? I don't know if anybody ever had a hot rock massage on your legs, but it's, it's heaven when you're done. So uh, other ones are energy therapies. 
this could be measurable or not, and it's a concept of infusing um, a subtle energy. And some, some sites actually have people that practice this. I don't believe that CHOP does. There are whole medical systems like Ayurvedic or traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, where you're giving, you're stimulating the body to heal itself by very small doses of a diluted substance. And there's um, natura, um, naturopathy, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying it right today, um, naturopathy. And this supports the body's ability to heal itself through changes. This can be herbs massage, joint, and there are naturopathic doctors, NP, who go through programs. So, and there are people that go through programs who just specialize in traditional Chinese medicine. They're very specific. So I think that what I hear the most about are biologically based, and these are vitamins, minerals, and other natural products. They may be something like an herb, it may be um, vitamin C, vitamin A, the other thing is that people are often asking about probiotics and, and prebiotics. In the, the world of cancer treatment, a, a probiotic is a live bacteria, and they are often frowned upon if the counts are down, because what it means is that the system can actually be overcome, meaning the bacteria can grow too much, and then it can go through the intestine into the bloodstream. So we do not often recommend probiotics. The prebiotics, on the other hand, are not live, but they help promote healthy bacteria, and these are usually fine. So, um, a little bit about CAM, and we know that um, this was not in kids with cancer. 12% of children use CAM. It can be for pain, cold, stress, ADHD, and the most common therapies are natural products, omega-3, this is a big one, echinacea, um, even chiropractic, osteopathic, and then yoga, meditation. So we know that this is um, being provided for children and non-oncology related. We also know in the U.S. that 31 to 84 percent of kids with cancer are using CAM, and it's more common in parents who are older and use CAM, and children who have poor prognosis. We also know that less than half, par half the parents and less adolescents will share this information, which can be a problem. So the Children's Oncology Group, which is the consortium for children with cancer, they have a subcommittee that addresses CAM. They have been looking at things like Tremil, which is a product for mucositis, acupuncture for pain, and glutamic acid for neuropathy. So they actually, um, when we, we did a survey to see how institutions were doing providing information, we found that 38% of information provide information, the rest do not. This was a survey done for all the hospitals that participate in um, Children's Oncology Group in North America. The RD is the primary person. Often the other practitioners are not as well versed, and there's no standardized resource of information, which is why I provided some information in your packet so that you can see reliable sources. We also know most commonly prayer, spiritual healing, mind-body, herbal, nutritional supplements, and massage are used for managing pain, hypnosis. If any of you are working with people, you know, psychologists, um, they're excellent at helping with some of these techniques like biofeedback, guided imagery, and um, we have used acupuncture, and there have, we have not at our hospital, but it has been used, and um, bleeding has not been a problem with it. Again, distraction, music therapy is, is huge at CHOP, so I think that's another nice one. Um, there are some, some studies that have looked at helping nausea and vomiting with acupuncture, acupressure, and acupressure bands. And we also know that massage, I mean, we feel better after we get massages, so certainly it helps with kids. Um, I want to just mention something, and this is a, um, people often think that if it's natural, there's no problems with what I, you know, what I am using. Well, there can be. So a lot of drugs are metabolized through this specific cytochrome P450 pathway and these enzymes. And some medications and some foods can actually affect this enzyme. If we affect this enzyme, then it means the chemotherapy drugs are not working as well. So things like milk thistle, salpometa, this list, have no effect. Another thing that comes up are antioxidants. People think that they protect us, right? But during, it's controversial because during radiation and chemo, the goal is to destroy cancer cells and antioxidants may protect cancer cells. So we often do not recommend supplemental use of those. 
And milk thistle is something that's been used, I'm not sure if you've heard, with, um, uh, for the liver when uh, enzymes go up, particularly with patients with leukemia, ALL. So another question that came up, and I actually reviewed this, or what do I do to boost you know, the immune system? Um, mushrooms have been looked at because they increase natural killer cells. And there are tons of different kinds of mushrooms if you looked at the stores and what's out there. We also know that blue-green algae um, stimulates immune function in vitro, but not in humans. You remember, a lot of this has not been done in humans. And the other thing is that there, there can be contamination, which could be harmful. There's not enough data to make recommendations. So one thing, taking it a step further with biologic therapies, one of the ones, St. John's wort, this is one that's used for depression. That can affect that pathway that I was just men mentioning. Curcumin is another product that's being tested that can affect it. Um, ginger is something that can affect platelets. Echinacea can actually have an effect on um, immunosuppression and leukopenia. And remember also that a lot of these products can be contaminated. Very important to look at the source. So the take home from this part is that not everything is as it seems. So you need to be careful. Um, only a few CAM modalities have been validated, evaluated in children, and there's limited information. I also think that sometimes because people don't know, they may be biased, which is why I try to educate families as well as clinicians. Even though there's no evidence that CAM cures cancer, um, it does seem in some situations to help alleviate side effects, and I think that is important. So considerations, where do you get your information? Is it reliable? Um, what does the family want to know? What's the modality they're interested in? Um, if they're interested in a product, there's a database called Natural Standards Database. Almost at any hospital, you can get information from this database, meaning go through your dietitian or your physician. Dietitians all have, in oncology have access to this. And what I um, share with you also in your folder, you have, um, there's a database in the Office of Dietary Supplements and there are monographs. And they will go through, is this good? Is it not good? Should I not use it? Um, and then also, have, um, has the patient and the physician reviewed it? Are there no risks? First is do no harm, always do no harm. And um, again, is their information reliable? Is the team aware of this? And does, this is I think an issue, does the family know where to purchase products that are reliable? So I think for CAM, families need to know if they're interested in this, and clinicians, if they're interested in CAM, to make sure that they have the appropriate knowledge to make decisions, the risks and benefits, and clinicians need to take the initiative to learn about it. Honestly, it's a, it's a different field. So the last part here that I'm gonna finish up with is a little bit about moving into the next. So this is um, after everything's all done. Most important issues to me have been bone health and nutrition. So it's different for every survivor. Some gain weight, some lose weight, and, but the goals are the same. Be as physically active as possible, maintain an appropriate weight, and adhere to a healthy diet. So according to the American Institute for Cancer Research, they feel that once treatment has ended, cancer survivors should adopt the panel's recommendations for cancer prevention. So this, these are the recommendations. Be as lean as possible, though not underweight, be physically active about 30 minutes a day, although some organizations feel this should be 60. Um, avoid sugary drinks, and these are just healthy guidelines. Limit processed, high-fat foods, lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and limit your consumption of red, and red meat and processed meats. So if you drink, and some people take home messages, I'm telling you to drink two drinks a day, but I'm saying if you drink, no more than two for men and one for women. Limit salty foods. Um, this is a big one. Supplements don't protect against cancer, so better to do in foods. We often say that a healthy diet is best. If you're not getting everything you need, then a vitamin mineral supplement may be appropriate. Um, do not smoke or chew tobacco, and food safety. Be very careful when you go out, especially if you have somebody with low counts. If you don't know where the food, how long it's been sitting out, who's touched it, etc. Um, rethink your pattern of eating. My plate has become very common now instead of the pyramid. About three-fourths of your plate, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, only a quarter from animal products. And then again, maximize the amount of vegetables. Vegetables and fruits have phytochemicals. 
and these are substances that help your body to um, destroy things that could turn into cancer. And um, watch your portions. So here's my plate. This is a very nice schema of what lunch and dinner should look like. And what's interesting is that they put the dairy on there, which most people don't, even when they're older, forget the dairy. And um, you can see that there's very little protein and they're focusing more on, on plant-based and vegetable. They're not saying don't eat meat, but they're saying not as much. So eating healthy foods. Um, variety, RDs can help. The nutrients, everybody knows about protein. It's important for your body, your tissue, your um, immune function, carbohydrates and fat. Remember, fat is your friend if you're trying to gain weight. It has nine calories per gram, the most, of all the nutrients. And vitamins and minerals are definitely needed. Water, people often forget about, and I always am reminding people, especially now during treatment, it's so hot. If your kids get um, dehydrated, they can feel really crappy. So standard serving sizes. No matter how old you are, there are always standard serving sizes. What we often do is we eat more, and um, because our plates have gotten bigger, so they're trying to get people to use smaller plates. Again, these are healthy guidelines. So um, emphasize plants, fruits and vegetables, five or more a day. You said you like to juice. Juicing is great, or you can buy a lot of juice products now. It's a nice way for kids that don't like to eat fruit or vegetables. Um, meats, limit the, the red meats. Um, often we say lean cut, smaller portions, bake, broil instead of frying or char broiling. Types of fats are important. The um, solid fat, which is saturated, this is the one at room temperature raises your LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. We don't eat coconut oil, but coconut oil can be in certain products, and palm oil is one of the ones that you put in a lot of baked goods. Um, so again, saturated fat, you limit. The monos are the good ones. These are liquid at room temperature. So when I say increase your fat, I'm not saying slap on butter and everything, but olive oil, canola oil, nuts. These are very healthy sources of fat. Um, they lower LDL, the bad cholesterol, not HDL, the good one. So um, this is often the one that comes up too. What kind of fats do I want to have? Polyunsaturated, this is the third group. We have omega-6, which are vegetable oils, which will decrease LDL, the bad, but it also can decrease the good cholesterol, HDL. There are omega-3s. This is the one that's in the media lot. This is not just from deep sea fish, but you can get it from flax, canola, soybean oil, or flax seeds, flax meal. And it does help to decrease um, heart disease, risk of heart disease, and other diseases, certain kinds of cancer. I would say the worst kind of fat that we could have in our system right now is trans fat. Even Oreos took it out of their cookies. Trans fat was a liquid fat that they took to the lab and they made it into a solid. So it takes over the, the qualities of a solid fat. So that's the one that we really don't want to have very much of. And so margarine, the harder it is, the more solid, the more it acts like a solid. So the softer, the better. So that's probably one of the worst fats that we have. So choose foods that help maintain a healthy weight. Again, avoid large portions, smaller amounts. Um, low fat and non-fat don't always mean low calorie. They take the fat out of it, they're usually adding some salt or some sugar to increase the flavor. So um, substitute some low calorie type foods for calorie dense. And these are again more common sense type things. So if you're going to look at um, nutrition, again, red flag, there are testimonials about it. There are no magic bullets. There is nothing that is going to be, um, you know, is going to cure one problem. It's, it's everything mixed together. So where does the information come from? I'm a registered dietitian, which means I have a bachelor's in nutrition, and I also completed a... Um, a nine-month internship and pass an exam. Anybody can call themselves a nutritionist. I'm not against, you know, a nutritionist, but realize that everybody has different training. So we are very different um, in our background. Always look at food labels. Look at what you're getting so that you have an understanding of that product. If the goal is to gain weight, look for products that have more calories in a serving size. Get familiar with the nutrition labels. You know, how many servings, what's in a serving size. And then with supplements, nutrients and foods are much better than a pill. So you shouldn't use a supplement to replace food. Eat a variety. Um, avoid supplements that are greater than 100% of what's needed for the age and sex. The one exception to this 
is, and this is coming up more commonly now, is vitamin D. We are finding not just in, in oncology, but in the general population, that vitamin D deficiency is very common. And um, that can be a problem. So the benefits of exercise and good nutrition, it promotes healing of tissues, organs, builds strength and endurance. We also know that it reduces the risk of certain cancers, decreases stress, and provides a sense of well-being. So lastly, bones. We have 206 bones in our body. Did you know that? Um, they're all made of calcium and phosphorus. And in, in survivors, they may never reach peak bone mass because of treatment, or they may have increased loss. So there's two ways they could have problems with their bones. Puts them at increased risk for osteoporosis, which means weak bones, too little bone formation or too much loss, and that means increased risk for fractures. So I don't know if your kids have had DEXAs done, that looks at bones, helps to evaluate how strong they are, whether or not they're where they should be for the age, and um, takes less than 20 minutes, doesn't hurt. Usually this is something that happens very early in survivorship that I see in many kids now. So risk factors outside of cancer, if you're a female, have a family history, Caucasian or Asian, you're small, thin, older, and other things like you smoke, you don't take in enough calcium, weight bearing. And this is a big issue when kids are in therapy. They're not exercising, they're not moving around. Too much salt, caffeine, soda, or alcohol. And then put another layer on top of it with treatment, steroids, methotrexate, um, radiation to bones, weight bearing bones, and any um, changes in hormone levels. I'm not sure how many in survivorship have had. Um, some kids need uh, female hormones, some kids need male hormones some anticonvulsants, and again, inactivity. So what lowers the risk? Weight bearing, resistance exercises, your diet, most important, calcium. You want um, dairy, milk, supplements if you're not taking in enough, and um, recommendation depending on age is 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams a day. Vitamin D is very important. You see that in most, most calcium supplements. Helps to absorb your calcium. And um, dairy products are often fortified, and you'll see vitamin D is often not more than 800 IUs per day. So calcium, it's always found as a salt, calcium carbonate, calcium citrate. Recommendations are on elemental, and I, I um, often tell people that this is one of the times where you want to buy a, um, um, not a generic brand. You want to know that what you're getting is what's on the bottle. So if it's calcium is bound to something in a, in a supplement, it's not 100% calcium. It can be 40% calcium. So this is where it gets tricky. If you get generic, they may not tell you that what you're getting is all elemental. So um, 500 milligrams could actually be 200 milligrams of calcium. So make sure that what you're looking at is elemental. All right. Calcium carbonate is what's most, most often used, and um, usually it requires stomach acid. So some people, uh, you know, have to eat it, you know, with a meal, not more than 500 at a time, 500 milligrams, your body can't absorb it. And um, so just be wary of that. So look at the label. I don't know if everybody's looked at the daily value, DV. That is generally based on an average person taking in 2,000 calories or 100, their needs of 100 milligrams of elemental calcium. So if it says it provides 10%, it's 100 milligrams in a serving size. So note how many tablets are needed. Another label to look for is USP, and what that means is US Pharmacopeia, and they, they um, adhere to higher standards, okay? So beware of generic and avoid oyster shell bone meal. They have other things in them. So in summary, there are complications with treatment that can affect nutritional status. We know there are different things that we can do to provide nutrition and medications to alleviate symptoms. Even if you don't know what these medications are, you can always ask, what can we do about this problem? And then the goal is to be as healthy as possible and dietitians are there to help. This is why I do what I do. This is the best for me, a child being too fat and eating pizza. So you have everything you need. And then, so in my mind, be as healthy as you can, eat well, exercise, reduce stress, and rest. And as you said before, one day at a time, patience, one step at a time, things don't just automatically go back to where they were before.